Здравствуйте, товарищи. Welcome back to Russian Through Propaganda. Today we're starting our third semester of Russian and uh, we're transitioning from actually Russian Through Propaganda into Russian Through Poems and Paintings because we're uh, going back in time away from the uh, Soviet period and all those Soviet propaganda posters to looking at the um, imperial period before the Bolshevik Revolution. And so as we go through our grammar, we're going to be uh, looking at a lot of classical Russian paintings and uh, and poems by the likes of Pushkin and Lermontov. So most days I'll have one video for grammar and I'll post an additional video uh, looking at the day's uh, poem. We'll have a poem almost every day. Today we don't have one, but that's a bit of an exception. Uh, so let's uh, dive right in. Uh, today we're going to be reviewing just the basics of the case system and the basic uses of each case. So pretty simple stuff, but very important stuff. And uh, we're going to spend several days of re review before we go into anything new, really. Um, so be sure and refresh your memory of both the case system today and in the coming couple of days. And then we'll review very carefully all of the verb conjugation patterns we learned uh, before we review quickly what we know about aspect and then finally dive into what we call advanced aspects, which, which I think will be quite interesting, actually. Uh, so uh, try to jog your memory. And uh, once we go through this review, we're going to have to assume that you're reasonably familiar with the case endings, right? It may take more practice to master them, of course, especially when you're speaking Russian. Uh, but, right, we have to start somewhere here in semester three. And so following this review, we can uh, say that the, uh, the training wheels will come off, the water wings will be thrown in the garbage, and you'll sink or swim, right? Um, so uh, let's start today by talking just again about the case system. Everyone knows what this is. Uh, so let's start with not so much looking at the endings. We're going to save that for later. Let's just talk about what the cases are and the basic roles they play. So very basic but very important stuff. Let's start with the nominative, right? Uh, the nominative is used for naming stuff, basically, and uh, it's used also for subjects of Russian sentences. So we're simply pointing at stuff and saying, like, at the kniga, we're naming it, pointing at it. We're not doing anything to it. Uh, we're not using it as a tool or anything like that. Just very simple, right? That's nominative. Uh, secondly, uh, a Russian subject is always going to be in the nominative. So we're going to be playing this game a lot as we uh, now analyze more complicated sentences or read Russian texts, right? If you're stumped by a sentence, one of the first questions you can ask in analyzing it is, what's the subject? And in Russian, that's that uh, question is pretty cut and dried because the Russian subject is going to have to be in the nominative. So you've got to find a word in the nominative. That's your subject. It doesn't matter where it is in the sentence. Uh, and finally, uh, the nominative can also be used for predicate nouns and adjectives. Uh, for example, he is a student, right? He is the subject. That's in the nominative. Student is a predicate noun. He is a student. That predicate noun will also usually be in the nominative. So let's look at some simple examples here, and uh, we're going to ask some questions and make some statements about a painting. This painting is called Maslenitsa from 1919. So this is actually from shortly after the revolution. But uh, anyway, this is by uh, Boris Kostodyev, a very well-known uh, painter. He painted a lot of scenes like this, which is sort of uh, town scenes and, and uh, cityscapes and whatnot of people uh, celebrating. So the, Maslenitsa is a little holiday that comes before uh, Lent, right? The long uh, period of fasting for Orthodox uh, Russians before uh, Easter, basically. It lasts for around a month. And so uh, that's called Veliki Post in Russian, the great fe uh, fast, excuse me, fast. Uh, a fast is a post. And so on Maslin, for Maslin, it's, uh, they, they kind of, at least traditionally, they used to cut loose and kind of party. You see people riding around and frolicking, and they eat a lot of pancakes and stuff like this and try to sort of gorge themselves before the start of the uh, the fasting period. Okay, so uh, let's just look at a couple of examples as we describe this painting. Uh, first, это картина кустодьева. Это картина кустодьева. Okay, the, word, the words in bold here are in the nominative. Here we're simply pointing at this painting and naming it, right? It's a cartina. This is a painting. It's a painting of Kustodiev. The cartina is troika. On the painting, literally in the painting, uh, there is a troika. A troika, right? Three horses. So, what's the subject? Troika. 
How do we know? Because Troika is a feminine noun, uh, and we know that, and here we see it we see it in the nominative, so it's our subject. Well, what's a troika? Stutakoe troika. Troika is a group of trioch lechidier. A troika is a group of three horses genitive. So we have a subject, troika, uh, and we're kind of defining it with a predicate noun, right? What's a troika? Well, it's a group, right? Grupa troch uh, Okay, so those words are all in the nominative, very simple. Um, let's look at some other uh, descriptions of this painting and uh, try to pick out the subject, right? Which word is in the nominative? Um Vatam Gorji yes teater. Okay, quiz yourself, pause the video if you need to. Teater is the subject, right? And we mentioned that the subject can come anywhere in a sentence. We know that Russian word order is very flexible. And uh, typically, if you recall, uh, what's regarded as new or most interesting about a given sentence is saved for the end of the sentence. And quite often that'll be the subject. Vatam Gorji yes teater. Uh, next sentence, Piri teatrum talpa. In front of the theater is a crowd. Okay, the subject is talpa. And you see how we've, we've already talked about the theater. Now we say in front of the theater, we just talked about there's a crowd. That's the new part of this sentence. And so it's saved for the end. And it is our subject. Teater da volna marinki. Okay, theater is the subject again, teater. And it is da volna marinki. It's rather small. And so we call marinki a predicate adjective. It's modifying the subject teater, and so it's also in the nominative. Paulitsi yedit troika. Along the street rides, or right goes, under is underway a troika, right? A team of three horses, a troika. Okay, what's the subject? Troika, of course. Now there's, a again, a very simple example, but look it over. Paulitsi that's a prepositional phrase, right? So, of course, ulitz uh, cannot possibly be the subject. Yejit is a verb, so kind of by process of elimination. Right? Sometimes you can use that if you're kind of stumped, right? Troika is the only word here that could possibly be the subject, and indeed it is. Maslenitsa et praznik. Okay, again, kind of a definition sentence, right? Maslenitsa is a holiday. So, which words are in the nominative? Maslenitsa, that's the subject, and then praznik, right, the kind of, we're defining Maslenitsa. V magazine prodajutsa sir i ikra. In the store are sold cheese and caviar. Okay, here we have a compound subject. Sir is in the nominative. Ikra is in the nominative, right, compound subject linked by i. We have a passive verb, prodajutsa, right, plural Passive verb with that reflexive particle. And, of course, magazine, again, is a uh, prepositional phrase, so that can't possibly... Uh, the, magazine can't be the subject of this sentence. Okay, let's talk now about the genitive. Uh, again, quiz yourself. What are the basic uses of the genitive? Well, the first one is possession, right? So this is the book of the student, or this is the student's book. That would be a tecniga studienta, Right, studienta, the word ex express, expressing possession, telling whose is appearing in the genitive. Uh, now, moving on from that, it's useful to think that in, in the uh, any Russian word that's in the genitive can often translate uh, into English with of, and that usually makes very good sense, right? So, for example, kniga studienta, we could translate that kind of literally uh, book of student, right? Of student right? That idea that in English is expressed or can be expressed with a preposition of is expressed simply with a case ending in Russian. Here the genitive case ending. Uh, so the genitive is also used with almost any, uh, in almost any situation where we might use of in English, like with quantities, like a lot of people or a bottle of mineral water or whatever. Also with, with numbers, right? We'll review that in depth later. Remember that numbers uh, 2, 3, and 4 are followed by the genitive singular. Numbers 5 and above are followed by the uh, genitive plural. Okay, so let's look at some more examples. At the kartina kustodjeva. Okay, we saw that earlier. Kustodjeva is expressing possession, right? We say in Russian, this is a painting of 
whoever, right? Of Kustodiev. At the center Gorada, this is the middle of the city. Okay, uh, again, of the city in Russian, that's Gorada, simply uh, adding a, uh, a genitive ending. В городе есть много деревьев. In the city, there are a lot of trees, right? A lot of trees, many trees, много деревьев. They're in the genitive plural. Okay, let's look quickly at numbers. Now, we have a lot more to say about number noun agreement. We're going to uh, get to that later in this, uh, this year, and that'll be one of the most miserable lessons in your entire uh, Russian career. It's just a, an awful topic. Uh, we know a little bit about it already. But anyway, for now, let's keep it very simple. В городе есть только один театр. Okay, we know that один is adjectival, actually. It's a special modifier, and it's followed by the nominative singular, right? So here we actually don't have a genitive because we're using the number one. Один театр, one theater, только один театр, only one theater, is in the city. В тройке есть три лошади. In a troika, there are three horses. Okay, so in Russian, we've got three, right? The number is two, three, four. We're going to follow this up with the genitive singular. And so we have here three loshidji. Loshidji in the genitive singular. Uh, next example. Vazdushny shar stoit pyat rublei. A balloon costs five rubles. Vazdushny shar, literally an air sphere. Vazdushny is an adjective from vozduch, meaning air. So a, a balloon cost piat rubles, five rubles. Five is followed by the genitive plural. Okay, we also saw the genitive used in in some uh, very important subjectless constructions last year, and um, it, the most important maybe being the non-existence or non-possession expression with yet plus the genitive. Remember all that. And so, of course, if we use this construction, uh, for example, umenya yet. Uh, machinely, I don't have a car. What's the subject there? There is none, right? And again, if we're looking carefully, we can answer that question very confidently because to have a subject, we need a word in the nominative. Umenya, that's not nominative. Yest is a verb, it's not nominative. Niet, uh, and then we get machinely. Okay, that's a genitive ending, so that is a subjectless, subjectless expression in Russian. Okay, let's look at some examples. Okay, no nominative there because that is an existence expression, right? So if we say, if we're saying that there is something or that someone does have something, we use yest plus the nominative. Very important. Now contrast that with this uh, more difficult construction. At him is not of an air sphere, so to speak. If we're translating that kind of literally, we get this genitive expressing the idea that we don't have something or that we have none of something. Okay, one example now with the plural. They don't have balloons. Okay, so now we're, we're talking about multiple people and we're getting a non-existence or non-possession statement. And again, with the genitive, yet plus the genitive, and we get genitive plural. Okay, let's look at more uh, descriptions of this painting and try to spot words in the genitive and explain to yourself what they're doing. Na zemlia mnoga snegu. Okay, on the ground is a lot of snegu. That's your genitive. Now, uh, here's a kind of special topic. Why isn't it snega, right? Sneg, snega. Well, snega is a genitive form of sneg, but this is a special, uh, it's called the partitive genitive form of sneg. And uh, some masculine nouns, a limited number of them, you have to just kind of memorize them uh, uh, as you encounter them, take a special partitive genitive that ends in u or u. Uh, right, so there, there were sort of two genitive forms bouncing around Slavic uh, for masculine nouns, a and u. And so when it, whenever you're studying a, a Slavic language, uh, most of them will have both in certain circumstances. It can be kind of confusing. So in Russian, we think of a as the default uh, genitive ending for masculines. But if we're talking about quantity, we can get this special um, partitive genitive that will be u and u or uh, u. Right? So, a lot of snow. 
But in городе нет цирка. In this city, there isn't a circus at cirque. Okay, so there's a non-existent statement. Cirka is in the genitive. В деревьях нет птиц. In the trees, there are no birds. Okay, non-existence here. Birds, genitive plural. Птиц is in the genitive plural. And there's a zero ending, right? Птица means bird. Птиц, zero ending. That's genitive plural. Again, we're going to review the endings later, so don't panic too much. На картине есть семь лошадей. In the picture, in the painting, there are seven horses. Okay, лошадей, genitive plural, because it follows сем, right? A number five and above. Пять. Что мы видим в окне магазина? What do we see in the window of the store? Okay, магазина is in the genitive. We could call that possession, although, of course, it's not always literally a possession, right? The store doesn't own the window. But you can get, for example, a part of something, like a, the window is part of the store. Uh, the window of the store, right? Makes perfect sense. Okay, next. Разговаривают два мужчины. Okay, two men are conversing. All right, мужчины. Uh, is in the genitive, мужчина, meaning man. That's one of those funny masculine nouns that has feminine endings. But the point here is that we're using it after dva. Uh, now, why are we using dva? Because, again, мужчина is masculine, despite having feminine endings. And so the numbers two, three, four, we get genitive singular. Dva мужчины, two men, разговаривают, right? Note the plural verb. Okay, let's look at another painting. This is called Kwomnata, literally in the rooms. So we have this interior scene, right? A Kwomnata is a room. Uh, this artist is named Zilin Sof. And let's just uh, look at the painting and ask a couple of simple questions and see if you could answer it or think how, how would you go about answering this question. And by the way, one, one really handy tip, it's kind of obvious, I guess, but it can be really useful, is that uh, whenever you're asked a question in Russian, that question will typically set you up for answering it correctly, right? And whatever case you may need, whatever aspect you may need, right, is kind of baked into the question. So if you look at the question carefully, it'll often give you some really uh, um, handy, it'll, it'll sort of give you a roadmap for answering it in, in a correct uh, grammatical Russian. Skorka zdes sabak. How many here of dogs, literally? How many, so how many dogs do we have? Skorka. Okay, it's a quantity question. Count the dogs. I only see one. Okay, so we're gonna we could say здесь одна собака. Здесь только одна собака, and there with the number one, we get the nominative, right? Одна собака, одна собака. Okay, next question. Сколько здесь мужчин? How many men are here? Okay, how many? Uh, well, I see two. So let's say two men. Здесь два. Мужчины. Два мужчины. Right? Two, three, four. Genitive singular. Есть здесь женщины? Are there women here? Okay, I see one in a painting, but I don't see any... I see a statue. I don't see any actual women, though. Okay, so we have a non-existent statement we want to make. There are no women. Okay, so women, we're going to need that in the genitive plural. And we can say здесь нет женщин. Right, zero ending in that nominative, uh, sorry, genitive plural. Genshina, we get rid of the ending, we get zero ending. Genshin. Здесь много или мало людей? Are there a lot or a little of people, so to speak? Are there lots of people or not many people? Well, mala. Right, so here again, quantity words, mala, mnoga. Uh, that's going to be followed by a genitive, right? Здесь мало людей. Yeah, but сказал, right? I'd say there, there aren't many people here. Okay, uh, next. Сколько здесь комнат? How many of rooms? Okay, we're counting the rooms. How many rooms? How many of rooms? Genitive plural in Russian. Okay, I see two doorways, and so I'm going to say that we, we can see three rooms, I believe. So let's say здесь три, три комнаты, right? Two, three, four, genitive Singular, feminine, uh, noun, комната, три комнаты. Сколько здесь стульев? How many of chairs? How many chairs? Okay, stool is a masculine noun. It's irregular in the plural, if you remember, right? The plural is стулья. 
Okay, let's count the chairs, and I only see two. Okay, so let's say there are two chairs. As uh, dva stula, dva stula, right? So two, three, four, followed by the genitive singular. Okay, so, um, next, skorkas dis orkan. How many of windows? Okay, we're counting the windows now. I see only two windows. So we could say zjes dva akna. Dva akna. Genitive singular. Skorkas dis stupienik. How many steps here? So a, st a step is a stupienka, like a stair or a step in a flight of stairs. Well, I only see two. So again, let's say we have two uh, steps. Zdis dvie stupienki. Okay, remember the number two comes in two forms. Dva is used when we're talking about masculine or neuter nouns, and dvie is used when we're talking about a feminine noun. And whatever comes after two is going to be, whether feminine or neuter or whatever, is going to be genitive singular. So zdis dvie stupienki. Skurkas dies zirkal. How many mirrors? Okay, I only see one there in between the windows, right? Mježdu oknami jest adno zirkala. Between the windows there are there is one mirror. Okay, again, now back to one nominative, adno zirkala. Zdis torka adno zirkala. Zdis jest koška. Is there a cat here? Okay, uh, well, I don't see one. So let's say he's a non-existent statement. There is no cat. There is not of cat, if we're translating sort of literally. Zdes net koshki. Da, u nich net koshki. U etich muši net koshki. K sežalenju, unfortunately. They're dog people, it looks like to me. Okay, uh, next. Če je te dom? Whose house is this? Okay, uh, če is our basic question word for asking about possession, and we would typically answer that uh, with uh, an adjective like moi or tvoi, or yvo, or with a noun in the uh, genitive, right? So we don't really know, right? But let's say this is the house of this man. I don't know which of the two men, but it doesn't matter. At the dom etva mushinli. At the dom etva mushinli. This is the house of this man. Etva mushinli. Finally, chata kartina. Whose painting is this, right? So, ktok. Uh, Kto hudojnik? Who's the artist? Kto hudojnik? Well, the last name, the familia hudojnika, the last name of the artist is is um, Zilinsov, and so we can say this is a painting of Zilinsov. Eta kartina Zilinsova. Eta kartina Zilinsova. Okay, next uh, cases. Let's look at the accusative and the dative, and again, just sticking to basics. This is pretty easy. The main use of the accusative is to show that a word is a direct object. And the main use of the dative is to show that a word is the indirect object. Right? So let's think about giving a present or something, right? The present is going to be the accusative. The, the recipient, the person we're giving the present to, is going to be in the dative in Russian. So, for example, Я подарил маме яхту. I gave mom a yacht as a gift, right? Я, я is the subject. With the real, the verb, mamia, dative, to mom, indirect object, yachtu, right, yachta, a yacht is feminine, so the accusative is yachtu. Okay, so again, today let's just try to spot some uh, uh, these cases in action here. And uh, we're, we're going to look at a painting called Karblinia Kur, The Feeding of the Chickens, literally, by uh, Ivan Kulikov from 1907. Okay, uh, so let's look at some simple examples. Vy vidíte tu kartinu? Do you see this painting? Okay, what word is in the accusative? Well, kartinu, right? Do you see the painting? We're seeing what? The painting, right? Što mi vidím? Kartinu. Okay, so that uh, uh, that's our direct object, and that's going to be in the accusative. Ljudi kormit kur. People are feeding chickens. Okay, so ljudi is the subject, kormit, there's your verb, kur, uh, that's your direct object there in the uh, animate, uh, right, it looks like a genitive plural form, but it's accusative for these animate chickens. 
the accusative plural, I should say. I need the yut kurm kurum. Okay, kind of a weird sentence, but whatever. Uh, for the sake of illustration, they are giving what? Food or feed uh, to the chickens. Okay, so kurm is the direct object. That's what we're giving. It's in the accusative. Kurum to the chickens, right? We're giving the feed to the chickens. That's in the dative. That's the indirect object. Okay, let's look at some simple sentences and pick out the words that are the direct objects, accusative, indirect objects, and the dative. We put the really at su novovishinka nadin rajdenia. We gave to dad a new puppy for his birthday, for the day of birth. Okay, atsu is the indirect object, right? You're not giving a, your dad to a puppy. You're giving a puppy to your dad. Atsu is dative, and novovashinka is the accusative. That's your direct object. Ya druziam raskazala smishnu yuistoriu a svayi simia. I told to my friends, Druziam, Smishnui Istoriu, a funny story about my family. Okay, indirect object, Druziam, dative, and uh, what what we told is in the accusative, Smishnuyu Istoriu. Right, I told a Smishnaya Istoria, a funny story to my friend. Friends. Professor Chasta Pakazavi Ruski Kartini Studentum. The professor often shows Russian paintings to students. Okay, what does he show? Russian paintings. That's their direct object, accusative. To whom does he show them? Kamu, right? Kamu on yich pakazavayet. Studentam, to the students, indirect object, dative. Okay, finally, uh, let's look at the instrumental. Uh, this is a little bit trickier. Uh, remember that the, the simplest meaning of the instrumental is to use something as an instrument, right? If you're doing something with something, using it as a tool or an instrument or whatever, uh, that word is going to go directly into the instrumental. Uh, we also see the instrumental after the preposition sa, meaning with. And remember, we only use the sa if we're talking about accompaniment, uh, right? Not using something as an instrument. So if you're doing something with other people, for example, you get sa plus the instrumental case. If you've got a pizza with sausage and cheese or whatever. That's right, the cheese and sausage aren't being used as instruments, right? So there you do need the sa plus the instrumental. And finally, you may recall this discussion from last year. This is a little bit trickier, but remember that predicate nouns can also appear in the instrumental when they fall short of an identity statement in the present. Okay, so that's kind of complicated. Let's review that, right? So we saw earlier today that if you say something like, he is a student, or this is a painting, uh, or a troika is a group of horses. We're making kind of uh, identity statements or um, uh, definitions or something in the present tense. So he is a student, or let's take another example, he is a doctor. That's an identity statement in the present. Our predicate noun, doctor, is going to be in the nominative. Uh, on vrač, for example. On vrač, he is a doctor. But if we have something short of that, like let's think about the past, he became a doctor or he used to be a doctor, right? That's a little bit short of this very high standard of identity in the present. So all of those instances would get the instrumental. On bul vrachom, on stal vrachom. Same thing if we look to the future. He will become a doctor. Uh, he will be a doctor. He wants to become a doctor, right? On budget vrachom. Or stanyet vrachom, on chochet stat vrachom, right? Instrumental, instrumental, instrumental. Now keep in mind also, even in the present tense, that if we have verbs of becoming or seeming or something is playing the role of something, right? Again, it's something short of literally being whatever we're talking about. It's more like appearance or seeming or becoming, anything like that. Then we're also going to get a predicate uh, noun or adjective in the instrumental. So for example, he is becoming a, uh, a doctor, right? Okay, so uh, let's look at some simple examples and again, try to spot the words in the instrumental. Kur kormit haroshim kormam. They're feeding the chickens with good feed. Okay, so what are they using to feed the chickens? What are they feeding the chickens with? Good feed. Kormam. Kormam. Okay, instrumental. Mach kormit synem i The mother is feeding with 
her son and daughter, okay? She's not using her son and daughter as tools, as instruments, so we need this sa to show accompaniment, and that's followed by the instrumental. Sinem i dočkaj. Kure skoro stanu tolstimi. The chickens will soon become fat. Okay, they will become fat. We have the verb of becoming. Uh, they're not fat right now, but they, they will become fat. We get our predicate in the instrumental. Okay, look at some more examples. See if you can spot the instrumental uh, case. Chudojniki často pišut maslom. Artists often write. Uh, sometimes the word for writing can be used for painting as well, especially if you're talking about icon painting. Uh, but anyway, uh, the artist, artists often paint Muslim with oil. Okay, so oil is the instrument. It's the means, uh, the paint they're using to paint with. And so that's put straight into the instrumental. Cartina na pisina kulikovim. The painting is painted or was painted by Kulikov. Okay, here's something we're going to talk a lot more about this in this book, actually. So this is a bit of a preview. But you often get uh, instrumental telling... Uh, by whom or with what something was done, especially with passive verbs, right? So napisen is a type of passive participle. We're going to learn a lot about these later. So uh, hold your horses. We're going to, uh, you're going to learn more about Russian participles than you ever wanted to know. Okay, so anyway, not, uh, but we can see napisen. Uh, it looks kind of like napisats, and it is from that verb. So the, the, pa the picture was painted or written, so to speak, by Kulikov, Kulikovim in the instrumental. Tistanish Chudojnikum, will you become an artist? Okay, there we have the verb, verb of becoming, so we get the predicate down in the instrumental. Okay, let's look over this table. Now here we don't want to spend all day on this. Just look it over and see how well you remember the major prepositions. We've definitely had all of these and what cases they take, uh, right? We've got prepositional, uh, now, by the way, we didn't review the prepositional case just now. Did you notice? Why didn't we do that? Because remember that the only time the prepositional case is used is after certain prepositions. So this little table right here, that's our review of the prepositional case. There's not a whole lot else to say about it, right? Other than it's, it's simply used following these prepositions. We've also got some uh, prepositions that uh, require the dative, the instrumental, the genitive, the accusative. Uh, so review this table and pay special attention to the prepositions in the black boxes. If you compare, you'll see that those prepositions appear in multiple columns because they can take multiple cases depending on how they're being used. And so that sort of thing we'll have to review quite a bit as we uh, go through the, the grammar here. Uh, hopefully you recall some of that last year. Like, for example, take V. Uh, hopefully you remember that. So if we say of bibliothèque, that means in the library, right? We were talking about gdia, about where we are. But if we're going into the library or to the library, we get v plus the accusative, v bibliotheku, v bibliotheku, right? So that v can take the, the prepositional case, meaning in, or the accusative meaning kuda, right? Into where or to where we're going. Okay, so um, let's uh, look at it. In a, speaking of which, let's look at a, an especially important table when it comes to reviewing prepositions. And we're going to be uh, learning a lot more about motion verbs in this book, uh, both some more advanced motion verbs and also we'll, we'll speak extensively about how to add prefixes to motion verbs. And so we're going to be seeing again these kudia, kuda, not kuda phrases all over the place. So we, we beat this into the ground last year. Hopefully you remember it. It's extremely important. Anytime we're talking about a location, including a person, like visiting a person, going to see a person, being at a person's place, anytime we're talking about, again, visiting people or visiting places, we're going to have three different possibilities. We could use kudia expressions, meaning we're at the place or at the person's place. We could use kuda expressions, meaning we're on our way there, we're going to the location or to the person. And we can use atkuda expressions, meaning we're coming from the place or the person. And remember that we have three basic sets of prepositions, right? We have v nouns, which are used for v locations. Uh, v, of course, literally means in, and it's also the default for saying at. Um, uh, for example, bibliotheque, right? Library is, we could call that a v now because we are in the library or at the library. 
Now remember that some nouns are called na nouns. That means they take na either because they're flat open spaces or sometimes for no particular reason. Uh, if you remember train station, voxal is a na noun. And uh, we can imagine why it's kind of a big open space, complicated with platforms and tracks and all this stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, no matter how you explain it, we simply need to know that voxal is a na noun. Meaning whenever we talk about a train station, we're, we're going to use the na set of prepositions. And there you see them in the uh, table. So for example, if we're coming from the train station, we say zvagzala. Zvagzala, right? Uh, uh, because again, we need s after that uh, uh, with, the, with the na location. And finally, we have the, the set of prepositions used for people, like umami would mean I'm at mom's place, I'm visiting mom. Kmamia, I'm going toward mom, so to speak. I'm, I'm, go, I'm heading off to see mom. Or if I'm coming from her place or from a visit with mom, what, right? At mommy, at mommy. Okay, let's translate some sentences and look for gdje kuda at kuda phrases, right? This is really important. Mui často jezdim v Rasiju k druzjam. Okay, can you spot any gdje kuda at kuda phrases? Well, v Rasiju is a kuda phrase, right? To Russia with the accusative. Uh, k druzjam is also a kuda phrase. Two friends, right? Dating. We're going to see our friends. У бабушки всегда хорошо я ходил к ней вчера. At grandma's, right? So there's у, that's a где expression, at grandma's place. Things are always good. Я ходил к ней. I went to see her, right? I made a round trip. К ней. That's a куда expression, meaning we, we went to grandma's place. Я был весь день на работе. Я вышел с работы в пять. I was at work all day. I left work at five. Okay, на работе. Uh, работа is treated as a non-noun. We could also think about that as an activity. I forgot to mention that activities like or events uh, are all treated as non-nouns, like concerts, parties, also work. Okay, so if работа is a non-noun, then when we say we're coming from work, we've got to use са, right? We've got to stick with that same set of на prepositions. Я вышел с работы, I left work. Мы вышли из кафе и пошли в театр на балет. We came out of the cafe. Okay, so is cafe, that's an откуда statement. Uh, в театр is куда, right, to the theater. На балет, for a ballet, uh, that's an event, that's also a куда phrase. So в театр and на балет are both куда, phrase, куда phrases, they both take the accusative. Okay, let's review everything we've covered today by looking at some uh, another painting uh, by Fidota. This is called Sviezi Cavalier. It's from 1847, so a little bit older. And this guy was well known for his satirical paintings. They're very tiny, by the way, uh, but they're they're kind of funny. And there's a little bit of a story to be told if you look at all the clues in the painting. Uh, so let's uh, let's just look at some very simple sentences. Look at the words in bold and and see if you can analyze and tell what uh, what case they're in, and why. Это картина Федотова «Свежий кавалер». Okay, Федотова is in the genitive, right? This is the painting of Fedotov, the fresh cavalier, translating literally, right? So the guy there is the so-called Svezhi cavalier, Svezhi cavalier, looking very fresh there this morning. Okay, uh, герой картины – мелкий чиновник. The hero of the picture so to speak, is a petty clerk. Okay, so there we have two nouns. They're both in the nominative, right? Giroi Karstini, the hero of the painting, is nominative, and he is, identity statement in the present, a Mielki Chinovnik, a petty clerk. Okay, so both Mielki and Chinovnik are in the nominative, and we'd say they're predicate nouns. Okay, so this this type of the uh, uh, Mielki Chinovnik is a really important type. I mean, it was in, in Russian society at the time, and uh, they especially figure in a lot of literature, uh, and we're going to definitely talk about this. We'll see some good examples, some of the most famous examples, actually, of this of this chinovnik type in literature. Chinovnik ishou sibya doma, v svoye komnete. The clerk is still at home, right? U sibya doma, 
at his place, в своей комнате, in his room. Okay, that's a где statement, that's prepositional case, in his комната. Он встал ранним утром, он не мог спать. He got up, он встал ранним утром. Okay, what case is that? That's instrumental. Now, there's something we didn't go over today. that We could call that instrumental of time. And if you remember uh, from last year, uh, time expressions are really tricky because they involve pretty much all the cases, I think. It depends on the particular expression, right? You could get uh, any number of different cases. And with times of day, you get instrumental. So utram means in the morning, right? In the utra, utram, instrumental. So watch out for these time expressions. We'll review them at some point. Он не мог спать. He couldn't sleep, so he got up early. Hmm, I wonder why he was so excited. Комната чиновника очень грязная. Okay, what case is чиновника in genitive? The room of the clerk is very dirty. Looks a bit like a bachelor pad to me. На столе, на старой газете есть колбаса. Uh, on the table, on an old newspaper, there is sausage. See the sausage? Okay, what case is колбаса in? Nominative, right? Колбаса, feminine noun, nominative. Doesn't matter, of course, that it comes at the end of the sentence, right? But you see how we're kind of zooming in on this sausage. The sausage is really the point of the sentence. So on the table, on top of an old newspaper, blah, 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 is sausage at the end of the sentence. Чиновнику вчера дали какой-то орден. To the clerk yesterday, they gave some kind of medal. An order, right? Uh, you know, they had all these orders uh, of distinction, right, for, for merit and service to the Tsar or whatever, and he apparently got one. You see it there. Urdin. Okay, so that's the accusative. That's the direct object, right? They gave him what? They gave him a medal. They gave him an order. Он стоит с орденом, как будто он Tsar. He's standing with his medal, with his order, as if he were the Tsar, or as if he is Tsar, standing very proudly there, right? Okay, so he's standing with his medal. He's not using the medal as a tool or something. He's standing with it. And so we do include S plus the instrumental. On хочет стать важным человеком. He wants to become an important person. Okay, there's a verb of becoming. We get a predicate noun in the instrumental. He wants to become a важный человек. Uh, in his hair, there are curling papers. В его волосах папильотки. See those curling papers there? So he's going to have nice wavy hair there. Uh, uh, a bit of a dandy there. Uh, okay, so what case is волосах? Uh, prepositional, right? Волосы, hair is plural, a plural noun in Russian. And so волосах means in hair, in his hair. Служанка передает чиновнику сапоги. The uh, servant, the servant woman, that's a služanka, uh, she's handing over, she's giving, chinovniku, to the chinovnik, okay, that's in the dative, she's handing to the clerk his boots. Okay, so what is she handing? Sapagi, that's accusative direct object. To whom is she handing the boots? Chinovniku, dative and direct object. On gorda bakazavid ye novi orden. He is proudly showing to her his new medal, his new order. Okay, so he, there's a pronoun. That's the subject, nominative. Uh, by the way, ye is dative. He's showing to her. And, of course, orden is, again, in the accusative. Чиновники кажется просто смешным. The clerk, to her, seems simply funny, ridiculous. Okay, so it's clear... So often, this so often happens right in literature and elsewhere that the, the servants are very well aware of the idiocy of their of their masters and they're, they're kind of, they get what's going on and you can tell she's kind of smirking at him. I don't think she's entirely buying it. She's not buying into his self-importance. Okay, so uh, here's a good example. Predicate adjective in the instrumental, right? He seems uh, ridiculous. Okay, so maybe he is ridiculous indeed, but in, in this sentence we have a seeming verb. So after a verb of seeming, right, we get an instrumental uh, predicate. On pavidimum vipo butilko vina noichu. Apparently he drank up, perfective, right? On vipo butilko vina. He drank up a bottle of vodka. Okay, so butilko, direct object, accusative, a bottle of, 
uh, wine, I think I may have misspoke, not of vodka, but of wine, a bottle of wine, Nuochu. By the way, sometimes in, in the 19th century, you do hear, they talk, they're talking about vino, vino, and sometimes they actually do just mean vodka. Um, sometimes you get that, but here it looks like it was literally a bottle of wine. Okay, uh, finally, okay, so this clerk doesn't have a wife. Genitive, non-existence, expression, he doesn't have a jina. But, on the other hand, he does have a cat. See the cat? Okay. Uh, so, finally, let's look at some simple sentences with prepositions and just call out the name of the case. See if, how well you remember the prepositions. Chinovnik yishov chalatye. The clerk is still in his robe. Prepositional. That's a gdya statement we could say. He's in his robe. Yimu nada paiti na rabotu. He needs to set off for work. Accusative, that's a kuda expression. Pod stalom lejit butilka. Beneath the table lies a bottle. Okay, pod, uh, that's instrumental, beneath the table. On brosa mundir na stool. He tossed his uniform onto the chair. Onto the chair, kuda, accusative. Chinovnik gvarit sa služanki. The clerk is talking with his servant, his female servant. Okay, that's with, that's instrumental. Chinovnik umieti grat na gitarje. Does he know how to play the guitar, or to play on the guitar, literally? Well, we don't know, but he has a guitar. Da u nivo yes gitara. Možete on umieti grat na gitarje. Okay, that's a gdje expression with na, prepositional. Na njimi jes ptice v kletke. Above them is a bird in a cage. Did you notice the bird? Um, okay, above them, above takes the uh, the instrumental. Uchinovnika nibalshaya komnata. At the clerk is a not large room, right? So he's got a modestly sized room. That's the genitive after u. Kchinovniku goisti redka chodjet, I'm guessing, right? Guests rarely come to see the chinovnik. That's a kuda expression with the dative for visiting a person. On vazmyot sapagiat služanki. He will take the boots from the servant. Okay, ot takes the genitive from the servant. On adjenit sev mundir. He will dress himself into a uniform. That's a kind of a funny Russian idiom. You dress into something. Makes sense though when you think about it. Sev mundir, we could say that's a kuda expression, into the uniform, accusative. Finally, on vujit is komnate na ulitsu. He'll step out of his room. He'll leave his room and go out onto the street or outside. So, iskomnati is a kuda expression, na ulitsu, uh, sorry, iskomnati is an atkuda expression from his room, na ulitsu is a kuda expression, onto the street, outside. Okay, that's it for today. So we went over a lot uh, as quickly as we, we could there. Uh, hopefully it was relatively familiar and even enjoyable, I dare say. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to start reviewing the, the case sending specifically. Until then, Das Vidanya Tavarishi.